My name is Mark Madden, ex of TNT Monday Nitro. Welcome to Starcade 2. It's where every wrestling fan should be. And if you can't be here, you should be watching it on Fight TV. It's my pleasure to be joined by a legend of the wrestling business. I'm standing. No, no, not at all, David. <laughs> I'm standing where Jim Ross once stood, Bob Cottle, Tony Schiavone. Oh, my word. It's the great David Crockett. David, the subject today is behind the paint with Sting. And as a lifelong WCW fan and someone lucky enough to work for the organization, to me, Sting represented WCW. He was there pretty much from the beginning yes. and there till the very end, the last match on Nitro with Ric Flair. Sting is the individual that caught WCW on fire. He came in yelling and screaming. He took the fans with him, and he never stopped. Never, ever stopped. Well, let's talk about what enabled him to ignite WCW. Two big early turning points in Sting's career. The 1988 Clash of the Champions match, the 45-minute draw with Ric Flair. And then in 1990, at the Great American Bash, he won the world title. At that point, with all due respect to all the other great competitors, WCW was Sting. Yes, but you look at who he was wrestling. Ric Flair, the one and only Ric Flair. Woo! Uh, Sting had his best match, and Ric Flair had his best match, too. The competitors couldn't done anything wrong, really. Now, Sting is a very unique performer in that... He was a superstar under the guise of two very separate personas. At first, he was the surfer guy with the crazy face paint. Then he became the quiet guy, the brooding crow character, and was equally effective in each role. Well, when he became the raven, he was the raven internally and externally. And I have never seen anyone go through a morphosis just like that. In, on stage, off stage, Sting was very inward. Uh, to this day, I don't quite understand what happened to him, but it really was something to see. No, you're right. He took on many aspects of the on-screen persona, and uh, that's part of what makes any wrestler great. Well, now it's time to go behind the paint. Let's go to the Pro Wrestling Tee stage. It's Tony Schiavone and Sting. Well, what do you know? It's 10 o'clock in the morning, Las Vegas time. How many hungover people do we have? Wouldn't want you any other way. Wow, we've had a great time here. Thanks to Mark Madden. How about David Crockett coming back, huh? Whoa. StarCast 2 has been wonderful. I had a chance to sit up here yesterday with Jerry the King Lawler, Jr. Mark Henry and Davey Boy Smith Jr., and we were talking about Owen Hart and remembering him. And that's what we're about. We're remembering the great past in pro wrestling that really, if you think about it, is not that far removed from us. When we think about the 80s and the 90s and even up into the early 2000s, we think about some of the great stars. But no one made a bigger impact in pro wrestling, I think, in a short period of time than Sting. You go back, and Mark already mentioned this, you go back to the Clash of the Champions that we did back in 1988. Jim Ross and I were doing that show, and it was the first time that we saw Sting really on a national stage against Ric Flair. And even though the match, if you'll recall, ended in a draw, it really made Sting a household name. But with a lot of great wrestlers, or a lot of wrestlers, you could become a household name, but then you, sometimes they don't do anything with it. But Sting did a lot with it. It was the face paint. It was the excitement. It was the charisma that he had. And then as we move forward into the 90s, the middle of the 90s, we all remember Sting and the Crow. We're going to talk about all the incarnations of Sting. We're going to let you ask him questions as well. But I want to let you know that he and I really have only talked twice since 2001. And it was a couple of, uh, it was actually last year when we were in Waynesboro, Virginia together. Just saw each other briefly. And we talked in the back here just a few moments ago talking about what we're going to say. So, listen, it's my honor. It's my honor to be a part of his career. It's my honor to present to you truly one of the great superstars this business has ever seen. He's my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Steve!
I'm telling you, that entrance never gets old. <laughs> it doesn't, man. It just never. It's good to see you, man. Good to be here, Tony. Good to see you, too. Good yeah. to see you here in Las Vegas as yeah. well. Sting, I want to, I uh, fans may not realize this. You and I were talking in the back just a few moments ago about how you started in the business. And I know, I remember first seeing that you and Jim Helwig were the Blade Runners and a tag team. And, and that's really how you got your start in pro wrestling, am I right by saying that? Uh, eat, well, it's before the Blade Runners, actually. I mean, really? We, we, we did start out as a tag team, but we were the Freedom Fighters. The Freedom Fighters. Red, white, and blue. <laughs> Red, white, and blue. Now, there's a poster out there that Sting has signed, and you can see all the different faces of Sting. And we were talking about this one right here. Yeah, this one here. That, that's a first. I've never seen that one on any poster, any ad of anywhere of any kind. This was a personal picture that ended up on social media just after we lost uh, Jim. And I think I, I put a few pictures out. It could have come from me. I can't remember. But anyway, right. that's, that's one of our original ones right there. Right. And you guys worked for, uh, for Jerry Lawler in Memphis, right, as the Blade Runners. And can you tell us that story? Yeah, well, we, we uh, went through a wrestling camp in Southern California and sent out press kits all over the United States to different wrestling organizations, and only one of them returned our call or got back with us. It was Jerry Jarrett, and he asked us to uh, come out to Nashville, Tennessee, where we did our first TV taping, and we started right. out together as the Freedom Fighters, Right. two real green guys. He was 285 pounds and a monster. I was 260 pounds and pretty big, yeah, but I looked like 26. a little kid compared to him. And, um, man, we were, we were so green, and, and for about three months we wrestled and, and saw their guys getting hurt left and right because we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> and um, anyway, we were at uh, the Memphis Coliseum doing uh -huh. a show there, and I had separated my shoulder pretty bad. I couldn't wrestle, so Jim had to go in there, and I think Buddy, if it's Buddy Wayne. I can't Buddy Wayne? It, it could have been a Buddy Wayne. Anyway, he was managing at the time, and so he walked out with Jim, and they did some kind of spiel, and Jerry Jarrett, in the dressing room at the Memphis Coliseum, he's got his dip in his mouth, and he looks at me, he says, Sting, he's got his notebook, and he's looking at some stuff, and he says, we're going to have to finish you up, Sting, you and your partner. I said, finish us up. What does that mean? He said, it means we got to let you go. So they let us go, but he said, I'm going to place you. I'm going to place you with Bill Watts oh. in Oklahoma. And right. uh, so we didn't lose a job. We, we actually gained one, and we right. went to a better place for us anyway. So Sure. And then you... Then, of course, the fans on a nationwide level remember your years with WCW and Jim Crockett Promotions. And I want to go back, really, and talk about that Clash of the Champions match because that was the one we all say made Sting a star. Talk about that day. Were, were you nervous? I mean, I know it was a long time ago, and I know I can't remember what I had for breakfast the next day. <laughs> so were you nervous going into that, knowing how big on a nationwide scale that match was and you were facing Ric Flair? Oh, I mean, absolutely, yes. I was, I was very, very nervous. I mean, you're wrestling the nature boy. Uh, everybody wanted to be able to get into the ring with Ric Flair, especially for, you know, the world title, big world title matches. It was like a dream. And, uh, you know, live TV, 45 minutes, um, commercial free. People forget that stat. That's right. That's pretty big, though. 45 minutes, commercial free, first time in the history of television, any kind of sporting event. Right. or any kind of event, right. really went 45 minutes commercial free. And so, but, you know, I felt confident at the same time because I was in the ring with, you know, the greatest, and he right. trusted me, and I trusted him. Right. Uh, and safe to say that this was the sting right here. Is that right? The one with the blue face paint and the spiked blonde hair? I don't know if you wore that exact same face paint. No, not. but that's, that's about the yeah. right time. Yeah. yeah. Which, which begs the question, how did you decide how to paint your face because you paint your face so many ways you know you painted it white and black you know later in the career that we just saw then you painted it red for the wolf pack but in the early days how did you decide we, how to we, paint your face yeah we we started out with with this one the first one we talked about you guys can't see it but anyway yeah. if you get this poster that one right there was the very first paint that uh, jim hillwig and i did together uh -huh. as a tag team and we did it just to try to get attention you know we wanted to match with the road warriors so hey let's add a little bit of paint to our face like the road warriors do and maybe we can get a match with them somehow so it just kind of evolved from there into you know we split off he went his way and became the dingo warrior right you know in dallas for world class and and uh, i was i stayed with watts and then with crockett and then i don't know i just uh, it was one day that um, i think it was um, ricky morton 
was supposed to wrestle Rick in another angle with right. those two together. Ricky got hurt. We had just finished. Um, Rick had just uh, wrestled uh, Ronnie Garvin for the world title yeah. in Detroit. Remember, we did a hundred ten thousand dollar gate. You know, was it Kobo Arena or Joe Lewis? I yeah, it was remember. Joe Lewis Arena. Yeah. Anyway, and a great house. Ronnie Garvin wins the world title. We go back there a month later, and we did about a ten thousand dollar house. So. They immediately wanted to take the title off of Ronnie and put it back on Rick and right. put Rick with somebody, and it was going to be Ricky Morton. Ricky Morton gets hurt, and so Dusty, who's writing and booking all the, the uh, storylines, says, Stinger, baby, I, wanna, I want you to put a little color on your face. I want you to paint your face. We're going put, to put, put, get some neon tights on you. We're going to get funky like a monkey, if you will. And uh, anyway... That's, uh, <laughs> that's, that, that's where the, the actual color of the, you know, the paint started then. He said, put some color on your face. No more black. I want to see some, some bright colors, you know. So we got the colors going, and the rest is history. Yeah, and I, I remember walking to the backstage area when you're painting up and looking at you and saying, what's it going to be today? And you, you just kind of went with it, right? I mean, there was no plan. or I mean, I, obviously for, like, the Great American Bash, Red, white, and blue. And, yeah. And, but before then, you just kind of went with it, Yeah, you it, just right? kind of wing it every night and just kind of come up with, you know, whatever colors, you know, whatever tights and boots you got, and then right. get your paint to match. And right. I don't know, just a different design on the face every night. Well, like I told him backstage, you guys know that I'm a big Kiss fan. Kiss has never aged, right? They paint their face. It's the best gimmick in the world. Everybody else, look how old he is. Oh, Sting looks the same. Greatest no, I, I know better than that. No, no, no <laughs> amount of paint can cover up that. <laughs> well, He's changed. <laughs> you had that injury. Everybody knew that in, in 89 that you were going to probably be the next World Heavyweight Champion. Had that injury. How did that affect your mentality or affect your excitement leading to your career? I mean, it's, it's one of those times, you know, my, my injury was one of those that, was, that needed reconstructive surgery. Yeah, that's... And you don't know if you're really going to be able to come back. Right. Uh, and if you can come back, are you, you know, is it going to be too late? Will you have missed your window of opportunity? To, you know, you had a window, you were in it, you were on the ride. And I've, I saw so many guys get hurt or injured or have other personal problems and have to get out. And lost that ride and tried to come back and when they came back things were different it just just it, it, it wouldn't click for them again and so you know and it's a dog eat dog world pro wrestling is you know everybody's we're all buddies we all love each other but you know it's very competitive and and you you want the number one spot you want that match against rick flair you want to run with the four horsemen and you know uh so it was a scary deal yeah. And, um, you know, I, I found the best doctor in the country to do it. So it's supposed to be a seven-month out. I came back in five months at the Great American Bash. Right. And wrestled Rick in July in Baltimore. And, yeah. and um, I, I, that, was, that was pretty tough. My, my leg, my knee really wasn't ready. It, it was a freak thing, too, when you, you had the injury. It didn't happen in the ring. It happened outside of the ring. Outside the ring, yeah. yeah. It, but, you know, in those days, you're, you're doing so many TV tapings, and it's in and out of the ring. You, you warm up. You get loose and limber. You cool off. Then you've got to go again. You cool off. You've got to go again. It's like over and over and over again. Right. And so I had street clothes on, had the cowboy boots on and jeans and, you know, running to the ring and, and uh, you know, jumped off on my left leg to go grab up onto the cage. I was supposed to crawl into the cage and get into it with Rick and I uh, felt something go in my leg. I mean, I honestly thought that it was like a, was it Nancy Kerrigan, the ice skater that yeah, thought somebody, yeah. had, you know, the, the pipe deal. And it, so I thought somebody hit me with a pipe or, really? or something. I, I mean, I did. I looked back at the fans sitting in the front row and they were all like this. <laughs> I, I knew no one did anything. So, you know, I put my hand down there like this and I put my fingers underneath my kneecap. My kneecap was way up here way up high on my leg. It's pretty disgusting. But I knew exactly what it was. Yeah. So I knew my patella tendon was severed. It was gone. Right. And so I hobbled around, and Rick crawled out of the cage. I was supposed to go in. He yeah. didn't know what was going on, so he's crawling out. I got Wahoo McDaniels, and I think J.J. Uh, no, no. Uh, um, who was the undercover guy that was with us for, for so many years? Um, Dillinger, yeah, my gosh. Thank Doug you. Doug Dillinger. How did hey, I we're playing anyway, Doug Dillinger, Wahoo McDaniel, a bunch of other guys, and, you know, and I, I said, right. man, 
Rick's crawling out of the cage, and he's coming this way. I said, you got to stop him because, and I'm hopping around on my right leg, and from the knee down on the left side, the leg is just kind of swirling, turning in circles. No, <laughs> It's grotesque to think about, but, you know, please stop him, you know, and here he comes, jumping over the top of everybody on top of me. Rick, Rick, I'm hurt. <laughs> my knee's gone. Stop. <laughs> yeah. He was like a, a pit bull. Like, yeah, you know, blood. He was out for it. Right. Because when the, when the lights were on, the bell rang, he was like another human being in there, wasn't he? Oh, yes. Yeah. Especially if there were dollar signs involved. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think we're all like that. So you come back, as you said, they said seven months. You came back in five months, had the match with Rick. Biggest moment of your life? Maybe. I mean, you had yeah, big moments. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's one of the biggest for yeah. sure. I mean, the very first time I won the world title against Ric Flair, and it was in Baltimore, and the Baltimore was always a good town for sure. me. The reaction was incredible. I'll never forget that. Um, and I made it through the match, and I don't think if, if it was in, against anyone else other than Rick, I don't know if I would have come back in the whole five months like that, but I right. trusted him so much, and he kept reassuring me. He says, nope, nope, it's going to work. It's going to work. We'll make it work. Right. And um, I'm, I'm glad that I did it the way I did it. Right. All right, now I want to fast forward. I want to fast forward to the mid-90s. I want to fast forward to the NWO angle. Fast forward to the fact that, you know, you became the face of WCW against the NWO during that time. What was that time like for you? I mean, you, you completely changed your character. You really did from the, from the surfer, the blonde hair, the screaming, the vibrant sting to a guy who was very removed. How, did that, how, did, how was that for you? Uh, you know, it, it was a, a really good time and a really bad time all, really? all at the same time. Yeah, I had a lot of personal stuff going on in my life yeah. uh, during that time, but it was good uh, professionally because, you know, my creative juices started to flow, not just for myself, but for really for everybody, you know, for the NWO, for Hogan, for Lex Luger, for, you know, Marcus Bagwell, for, for all, all the guys. And, and, I mean, we were all like that. Everybody was kind of helping each other, but it was a good time for me. I kind of felt like at that time I, I came into my own and, uh, you know, I took risk and changed my character again. And it was, again, one of those times where you can get injured and miss a while and come back and things are not the same. Or you can change your character or do something like a shockmaster kind of a thing and never recover from it. And, um, you know, and I, and I knew that, you know, painting my face and doing something different and no talking and, you know, hiding up in the rafters and all that could have been something that you guys would have just laughed at and hated. And uh, I couldn't have recovered from something like that. So I'm grateful that it worked, and I had a lot of fun doing it. Do you really like going up in the rafters like that? No. <laughs> no. I always tell people my sphincter muscle was very tight. Yeah, I bet. Absolutely, yes. I bet. But it all worked out. Yep, it did. Even Panama City, you know, Vietnam vet who was the pilot, we had to, uh, to you know, it's a uh, college, you know, spring break, Daytona right. Beach. We've got to hover over the water out there by the hotels, the high-rise hotels, and the sun's going down and it's getting darker and darker. We have to wait for our cue till we come over the ring. And, uh, you know, I'm going to repel. And uh, the pilot says, Sting, if uh, somehow or another the rope gets caught in the blades, I'm going to have to cut you loose. And I went, <laughs> <laughs> And he's looking at me like this. <laughs> he was dead serious. He was going to cut me loose, you know. Yeah. I was like, well, if it gets caught in the blades, we're both going down, bro. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was scary stuff. Uh, there's a lot of stories, and some of them, you know, I could, I could never tell. And, you know, Owen, we, we cannot forget Owen, um, how appropriate. You guys right. were acknowledging him. And, yeah, um, yeah I, I could tell you some, some stories, you know. I mean, honestly, there was one night in particular, Chicago at the United Center, where, I mean, this far from that very thing happening. That, that was a football field high, so... Yeah, jeez. Yeah. I, I, I remember thinking, yeah, he's up there. <laughs> I, I hope it all works out. And it did all work out. But I want to go back to something that everybody talks about and, and get your opinion on. And you can talk about it however you want to. And that's the one match that we built up with you and Hogan at Starcade. The finish of that match is one that's been discussed and debated and, and booed on. Yeah. Let's talk about Starcade and the big build-up and, and the finish 
Um, let's go into the finish in great detail. We want to know exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because, man, I, it, unbelievable. I know. You of all people, Tony. Well, hell, I was the one that had to say, was that a fast count? That was a fast count. I thought it was going to be a fast count. What the fuck's going on? <laughs> we, we, we had a plan. <laughs> I did. Oh, we had a plan. It was a year-long plan, and it was in motion. And that day, suddenly, it, it wasn't in motion like it was anymore. So lots of changes, lots of behind-the-doors meetings happening. Um, and um, I think because of that, number one, I don't believe that our match actually followed the big buildup. No, you're right. It, it, it did not follow. Um, but I think it was due to all the chaos that happened, you know, the hours that, you know, of that day that led up to the match. And not knowing for sure what we were going to do and how we were going to do it, literally, until we walked through the curtain. And um, I, I think if we'd have just kept with the game plan and done what, what we had all agreed on, things would have been a lot different. The match would have been so much better. Right. The finish, the reaction, everything would have been better. And um, we wouldn't be talking about this right now. Right. The fact is, though, that was the top moment for our, for our business at that time, for WCW. That, that what are you trying to say? Are you well, trying I'm, to say I'm that saying, I sabotaged no, the company you know. somehow? It's my fault. It's a, no. he, it's a big setup here, see? <laughs> no. I'm being set up. No. Oh, I'm, I'm talking about... It's Sting's fault that WCW went down. Okay, I'm talking about... <laughs> I'm talking about the business. The business was hot at that time, and the business was no. Hot you just said that it was the biggest thing that the company had going, and you dropped the ball, Sting. <laughs> because of you, ratings went down. Yeah. Okay, you did win the title later against Hogan, didn't you? Uh, did I? I don't know. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like Steve Austin. Steve Austin doesn't remember any of the matches he had. I mean, I remember some matches and some okay, big, some big moments, but okay. you know, but. You know, yeah, I'm like know, you. I can't remember everything that we did. Yeah. I mean, we did so much. But did you ever think now you're, you, you guys are, you and Jim Helwig are sending out, you know, your, uh, your tapes or whatever to every promotion across the country. Did you ever think it would come to this, being one of the top stars ever in the business? I mean, it was uh, a long road. It really was. It was. Of course, I, you know, I, I dreamed of that happening. Right. And that was, that was my goal for sure. But right. I mean... You know, there's a lot of guys that think they're going to get into break into pro wrestling and dye their hair blonde or something and just come up with some kind of gimmick and, you know, bench press 500 pounds and squat 800 and, and you know, they're going to make a big name for themselves in wrestling. But it's just like trying to get into the NFL. Right. It really, it truly is. I mean, a lot of guys can get into pro wrestling. A lot of guys can do the regional stuff. And God bless all those guys because they're all trying and working their butts off and want to make a name for themselves and they want the you know, the big match, the big wrestle, WrestleMania matches and so on and so forth. Um, but, man, it, it, it requires a lot of uh, sacrifice and effort and, you know, keep your mouth shut and your ears open and listen uh, to help, you know, make, make it and learn from guys like Ric Flair and Dusty Rhodes and the Four Horsemen. And I'm just rambling now. So No, you can ramble. We want to hear from you. We, uh... I was looking at his watch. No. I mean, Tony's just digging his hole deeper with me. I'm, I'm going, he's going, I got, I got, my, I got my son here who's helping us uh, time things, so we wanted to make sure that we got the fan questions in, so he just sent me a text. And I got this new Apple Watch. Thank you very much. When WCW went down in 2001, obviously you, moved, you did some things with TNA. We saw you at WrestleMania. Talk about when WCW went down, some of your thoughts about the business and your thoughts about your career and your family moving forward. It's a tough time. It was a surreal time. Um, second class citizens, I've always talked about it for so many, many years, and I could tell you so many stories where we were definitely second class in comparison. Then we launched Nitro, you know, Hall and Nash, Luger comes over. 
Hogan changes his character, Sting changes character, NWO, the rest is history, just unbelievable. Uh, great, great time, and I'm rambling, and what was your darn question? Well, my question is, <laughs> my question was, I forgot. No, my, my question was. What was, was his question? That, my question was. See, I just need to answer the question and not ramble so much. About moving forward, about your thoughts about What your was it career. like when they came in yeah. and they took over and that whole thing? Yeah, yeah. surreal. That's a, it, and it was, you know, being second class citizens for so long and then, you know, literally having it, it, what was really like the enemy coming into the camp. Sure. And, and taking over and taking us, you know, hostage. Um, Man, I mean, it, it, it was not a good feeling, and, and you know, I left. The rest was, uh, it was over for me, and I kind of left, and with my tail between my legs, I had a contract um, that no one else could assume, so Vince right. couldn't take that contract. You know, Time Warner AOL had it, and they had to pay me for another 18 months, and which they did, and I just didn't have any job duties to perform. Right, and so I, I kind of did nothing there for for a while, and it was just just you know, not a good way to end. And um, how did it all happen? You think how did this slip through our fingers? We we were second class. We worked our way up to even. Then we went to surpass. Then we became the talk of the whole globe, and and we lost it. Right? How did it happen? You know, I mean, you just say what what happened? I mean, it may have been the finish of that match. I'm yeah, sure. it probably was. It was nineteen. <laughs> It was that Starcade, you know. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was tough. You, you did, you did stay away from going to the WWE for quite a while. W what brought you back? I mean, I talked to Vince a few times over the years and had great conversations with him. And you know, when I talked to him, it was always good. And and you know, I almost left on a few different occasions. Right. WCW always came to the plate and gave me what I asked for, so I stayed. Um, <clears throat> but. You know, after TNA ended, um, it just seemed like the one thing that I hadn't done, you know, was right. the, you know, WWE and WrestleMania. And so I sent the, the text message out to uh, Triple H and to Vince. And, right. You know, hey, have you guys turned the page on me yet? And then they hadn't. And so I did it. And I'm, I'm glad that I did do it. But, yeah, I, I wanted to be able to say that I did a WrestleMania. And I, right. just, I just wanted to see what it felt like and, and have that one last yeah. run. What did you think of that match, you and Triple H? I mean, it was at the stadium there in uh, San Jose, I guess. In, uh, Levi Stadium, yeah. Yeah, Levi Stadium. That was, that was quite a big moment. It really was. It was. It was a big moment for me. I mean, you know, those big stadiums like that with right. all those people, and, and, and it's a completely different environment. It's a WWE environment. It was, it was amazing. It really was. Right. Did you feel at that time, like many of us did, that you were still representing the old WCW? The storyline was, you know, they were trying to dictate that with a storyline, right? And, and I suppose <clears throat> there's no way to get around that, right? I mean, it, it's just, it's just, it just is what it is, right? Uh, but I think that people, you know, love that, sure, you know, just to see, you know, DX out there with NWO, right? You know, Hogan Hall Nash and everybody all in the same place at the same time. I mean, I've had so many people over the years since then tell me we didn't think we'd ever see anything like that. It was like a dream. Right. A dream come true for so many fans. It was a dream come true for me. I mean, you know, Triple H and I were, were selling there for a minute, and, you know, all the, all the other guys are doing their stuff out there. It was just kind of fun to watch and listen to the crowd, right. to the reaction. Uh, yeah. So it was a cool moment for me, too. Right. It, was, it was a cool match, as a matter of fact. And, listen, we do want to take your questions. We have Mike Williamson here. Where are you, Mike? He's right here. He's right in front. We, we've got... Uh, it's hard for us to see because of the spotlights, but yeah. uh, who's our first question? Tell us your name, and what do you got for Sting? Anyone got questions? questions? Oh, I thought you were standing there with somebody. Nope. <laughs> What's your question? Um, my question is, uh, Sting, facing The Undertaker, the, there was always a lot of rumors over the years. Do you think there's any chance nowadays that we might still see The Undertaker versus Sting? Um, the answer is no. <laughs> I just, I do not believe that it's going to happen. And it's something that I always wanted to happen. You guys all know that. I've been outspoken about it. I'm not even sure how he really feels about it. I'm not sure if he'd even want to do it. I've never asked him, 
you know we've had conversations i've never even talked to him about it but um the one thing that i do regret is not having that that match against him because i think we could have told an incredible story um it would have been a night to remember for sure All right, that guy's accent made that sound so much more epic. When you wrestled The Undertaker. Uh, next person? Yeah. I, I got it. All right. uh, ever any thought about switching back to the surfer sting for a match just to surprise everyone? Not enough hair on my head. <laughs> There'll be no flat top anymore. Those days are gone. I can put neon colors on and I can put neon paint on my face, but that's where it ends. Want me to carry a surfboard? I'll do that too. Hi, Sting. I was just wondering, who are your, some of your favorite partners to work with? Not, not high-profile matches, more like on the house shows, a couple guys that you really enjoyed working with. Some of the guys I like to work with in the house shows? Man, um, I had great matches with uh, Van Vader. I loved working with him. I really liked working with Leon a lot. I miss him, too. Uh, Rick Rude. I had great matches against Rick Rude. Um, I, you know, I'd say Vader, Rick Rude, and the great Muda. Those guys were like the, you know, after Ric Flair, I'd have to put those guys in there. I, I just loved working with all three of them. Great times with all of them. I want to say something about your matches against Vader because you had some great ones. He was, we talked about Flair being in the mindset, being a pit bull. When Vader was in a match, for even us sitting at ringside, he was scary as hell. I mean, he really he, had to lay it in. She you. should I mean, be in the ring him. with him. <laughs> I know. I mean, he, he, was, he could be pretty rough in the ring. Yeah, no, he, he, he was straight out of uh, Japan. Right, yeah. <laughs> when I wrestled him. Yeah, the strong we, style. Yeah, we, yeah. Were, we were in Gainesville, Georgia, doing TV taping, and Harley was managing him. Yeah. And you know, Gainesville, Georgia, it was a small arena, and so you know the dressing rooms are small, and the guys are underneath the bleachers, and their fans are sitting right above us, and we're looking through the cracks. We can see into the ring and all this. And, and uh, Harley's got a cigarette. He's smoking like this, you know. And he's, we're talking about the match, you know, and I can hear something in the, like an animal underneath the bleachers in the distance. <laughs> What is that? He goes, it's Leon. <laughs> What's the matter with him? He's throwing up. Why is he throwing up? He's nervous because he's wrestling you. <laughs> Am I going to die tonight? <laughs> Tell me. Am I going to die? He's straight out of Japan. He's 400 pounds. I mean, no, I did tame him. But, you know, by the time I did tame him, I loved working with him. Yeah. Great matches. I mean, you... I mean, 400 pounds doing yes. a moonsault off the top rope. Yeah. Nobody could move it like him. You're right. Oh, man. Yeah. Unreal. Yeah. We're in the Omni. He, he did one of those moonsaults on me in the Omni in Georgia. We yeah. hit the ring. We just hit weird that night. We bounced up in the air, and as we came down, I came down crooked, his whole, all his weight on me. I could see the rib through my skin like this as I went oh, like this. And I went, oh. I'm laying there. He goes, what's the matter? What's the matter? Are you Okay. I go, uh, no, I'm not. My, my rib's broken. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do I do? What do I do? Tell, tell Pee Wee to, you know, that you're going to get disqualified. Just pie face the referee, Pee Wee Anderson, and throw him over the top rope. And, you um, know, because sure, I, I had like to that. keep the belt storyline wise. And so I'm letting you guys in on some stuff here, aren't I? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, so, so he does that, and then he hits the ropes, and he drops an elbow right across my ribs. I'm going, no, no, boom, oh, you know, like, you know, comes in the dressing room, he goes, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, Steve, man. Yeah. He was the sweetest guy, actually. Yeah, he was, but got the game face on. Well, oh, yeah, when he got the dangerous. game face on, forget it. Yeah. yeah. Next question. Hey, uh, Stinger, Tony, um, to your left. Thank you guys both for being here. We appreciate you. Um, yeah. Uh, sort of a, a tough question to ask, so forgive me if it's a sore subject. Um, the program with Seth Rollins and the way that it ended, um, can you comment a little bit on the program, where it was going, and your thoughts of the match and, and the injury? Well, it's not a sore subject for me. I mean, for me, it's a good, a good subject. I mean, I, I got hurt, yeah, and it, it ended my career, but 
I went out in style. World title match, WWE, against one of the greatest, Seth Rollins. I'm, I'm glad I went out the way I went out. Um, you know, it, it, it's just one of those things where it, it, he didn't do anything wrong. It, 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 was, it was all me. I, and I, to this day, I, I just don't know what happened. But it happened two times, and the second time it happened, I, I couldn't feel my legs for a few minutes, and my legs felt like rubber. And it was a scary moment. And, uh, you know, for me, you know, it's like the wrestler mentality. You know, you, you think to yourself, well, you got to do the finish. you got to finish. you got to finish. <laughs> And it's like the others on the other shoulder, but your legs aren't working. What are you thinking? You know, um, <clears throat> but you know, I finally grab the ropes and make my way back up to my feet, and my legs start to kind of come back a little bit. And we continue the ma continue the match, and we finished it. And and I think it was it was okay. I think it was good. I think it was a good match anyway. I think you know I didn't want wrestling fans to say that Sting didn't bring you know, everything he had, you know, at his age, you know, to do that, that match. I, I wanted them to say, wow, man, even, even, even now he's bringing it, you know. And I think for the most part, fans were happy with the match overall. All right. Great question. Thank you. Next question. Tony, staying Terry over here on your left. Okay. Right over here, right over here guys. Yeah. Yeah. Terry from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, looking back on possibly the downfall of WCW, do you think going to three hours was the nail in the coffin for that? It was a contributor, but not the nail in the coffin. You know, you, you, you start out with a group of guys excited, you know, we're, we're making great progress, uh, huge gains every single week, the ratings are going up, the creative juices are flowing. There's not clicks. There's a group of people kind of all working together. There's unity. You know, whenever there's right. unity, good things happen. Without unity, it's never going to happen. And, and really the downfall, I mean, the final nail in the coffin was just that. You know, suddenly, you know, in the beginning you've got unity, and over time it, it develops into clicks and groups of people and agendas. And that's where it, it went downhill. Yeah, it, it's hard really to point to any one thing. Uh, I go back to the fact that it was run by a television company instead of a wrestling company. Uh, and to me, that was the, the really the final downfall. And that's why I'm hoping and thinking AEW is going to work because it's going to be a wrestling company, not a television company. So. Wow. Thank God. Yeah, absolutely. Thank God, Tony. Woo. <laughs> I was still worried about that Starcade match. And you, you cleared it up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And of course, to finish that fucking Starcade match, I should have. <sighs> okay, next question. Hey, Stinger. Um, I was just curious. Uh, when Ted Turner bought uh, in WCW, I just wondered uh, what your opinion was of working for uh, Jim Hurd. Yeah, the pizza man. I'll never forget, you know, talking with him uh, and negotiating with him. He put a contract in, in front of my face, and I think it was $225. It was a three-year contract. 225000 the first year, two fifty, and then two seventy-five. So it was a $25,000, you know, upgrade every, every year. And, um, and I said, I... I can't do that. And he said, well, what do you mean you can't do that? I said, well, it's, it's just not enough money. I mean, you know, the Road Warriors are making 500000 No one knows for sure how much Rick is getting. He gets paper bags at some of these shows, and we don't know how much is in those paper bags on top of his contract. And, um, you know, Lex Luger's making three hundred grand. I mean, Paul Ellering was making three hundred grand, and you're going to give me $275,000? I don't, I don't get that. So he says, well, you know, what would it take? And so I threw out a number, and he, <laughs> he coughed and choked and said, I don't see any precedent for that. He said, Steve Avery. Steve Avery is making $100,000 a year. I said, it's his rookie year. Next year, he's going to make, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, who knows? And, th and that's the way it went, too. Anyway, um, Jim Hurd, he was, he was funny. There's other stories I could tell you about him, too. But um, he ended up giving me what I wanted. 
and I think overall I had a good relationship with him. So he was a pizza guy, but I got along with him. <laughs> yeah, he was an easy guy. He probably said, I don't know if I'll give this thing that's goddamn money that he wants, goddamn it. Where's Jim Ross? Let's see what he has to say. He made everyone sign the contract in 30 minutes or less. Uh. <laughs> hey, Tony Sting. Uh, speaking of purchases, your first okay. big show after you came over from the UWF was Starcade 87. Uh, you opened up the show in a six-man tag. Can you tell me your thoughts going into that show in uh, Chicago? I don't even know who was in the match. <laughs> Starcade, six-man tag. You, it was you, Jimmy Garvin, Michael Hayes against Zabisco, Rick Steiner, and Eddie Gilbert. Oh, oh my gosh! What a nerd! <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> I don't remember one minute of that match. He terrified all the other wrestling fans here. They're like, I love it, but there's limits. <laughs> uh, Jimmy Garvin and Michael Hayes? They were my partners? You know wow. he doesn't know his mom's birthday, this guy. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Great memory, guys. Wow. Uh, yeah. You know, it, I, I brought this up many times, and, and w listen, we love you. We really do, and we appreciate you remembering everything. But when you do it every day, and you have so many matches, it gets lost in the shuffle, doesn't it? It sure does, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we were doing two and three TV tapings a night at right. times, you know. I right. Mean, yeah. Yeah, just, it's crazy. It really is. But thanks for the question. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, what were your thoughts on your feud with Abyss and your last rights match that you had together? With Abyss? I love that guy. The casket match that I had with him. We, we, we had so many good matches. He's a real creative guy, just the best attitude. He's got a really good mind for the business. Uh, he's a giver, not a taker. And um, I, I really just I loved working that, with that guy, and I, I could not say enough good words about him, and I, I miss those times. You know, actually with T, TNA... I had a lot of fun doing that uh, Joker character uh, that here in the United States it was hit and miss, but you know, in, in Europe they just loved it over there. And I, you know, I just, I loved it. If we had a, a bigger budget and more cameras, you know, I'm, I'm convinced you guys didn't see half of the good stuff that happened. I mean, some of my best stuff, I think, you know, was, was done with TNA with that Joker character, to be honest with you. And I had so much fun doing it. Okay, what else we got? Hi, Brian from Orlando. Hi, Tony. Hi, Sting. Um, the fellow here mentioned Taker in your last program against Seth Rollins. Is there someone uh, presently that you haven't had a program with in any promotion that you think you could tell a great story with right now? You know, the, the big guys like Leon White, I always love to tell that story. Braun Strowman, I think, would be a, a good one. I'd love to have something with Braun Strowman. We'd have a good match, I think. Yep. Bray Wyatt's another one I'd love to work with. Um, Okay. Hey, Sting. Um, so I'm actually from Baltimore, so I love the shout-outs. Um, was there ever a move, I mean, your finishers have been iconic, but was there ever a move that you wanted to switch to when you were changing gimmicks that you were like, you know what, maybe I should change my moveset, a finisher or something, or something you tried that didn't actually work out the way you wanted? No, the, the death drop and the death lock worked so darn good. I just had to stick with them, you know? No, I, I never, it never even occurred to me to, to try to, you know, figure out something else. I, between those two, I mean, I, that was it. I loved it the whole way through. Wouldn't change it for anything. Very good. Next Hello. question. Over here. Um, I became a big fan in 92 when you faced Mick Foley at Bash at the Beach. Um, can you just give your thoughts on that match and if it helped your career at all or just kind of your general thoughts on that time? I don't know if it enhanced my career in any way. It was surely uh, uh, fun being in the ring with, with Mick, with Cactus Jack. Um, I liked him. He was one of the more creative guys. And there's another guy who has a great mind for the wrestling business. Um, it was easy to work with him in that, you know, he came to the table with something always. You know, sometimes you, you work with somebody, they don't, they don't have anything. <laughs> it's just they bring nothing. But Mick, man, he was filled with ideas and innovation and creativity. And so in, those, in that respect, it was, it was really good working with him always. So good memories about him, including Germany when he lost his ear against Vader. That was a weird deal. 
Gary Capetta. Yeah. Sting, I have someone's ear. <laughs> Literally, he, he handed me, I, I go, yep, that's, that's an ear. <laughs> wow. Ooh. I thought he was going to put it in the, what's the stuff the doctors put where they, you know, they put a, a body part in the jar? And yeah. It, Formaldehyde, formaldehyde and it preserves it dry eyes or something. i think he wanted to do that <laughs> but he didn't do it long story short you know <laughs> i mean i mean the only thing he said was bang bang <laughs> that's it and jim hurt thought it was a pizza topping oh <laughs> yeah. hey sting tony um hypothetically speaking if tna never existed do you think you would have came to the wwe sooner personally i love your tna run but if TNA did not exist, would I have gone to WWE earlier? I, I kind of think probably so. Yeah. I mean, that's a straight up, yeah, I think so. Hello, my name is Wendy from California. And I just wanted to say, what, if the injury never occurred uh, and you won the World Heavyweight Champion, what would you have done? If my injury against Seth, that one? Yeah. If that wouldn't have happened, what was the last part of the question? And you won the world heavyweight title. And I won the world heavyweight title? What would you have done after you won the heavyweight title from Seth? Just bashed in the glory. <laughs> <laughs> WWE, WCW, TNA, I'm the greatest of all time. <laughs> now you're going to see the true sting come out. <laughs> It'd be time for me to turn heel because I'd be so darn good, you know? Nobody could touch me. You know, really, you, you, Ricky Steamboat, there's only a handful of you guys who never really kind of turned to heel. I actually worked heel in the beginning of my career. Really? And, and yeah, and, and with uh, Hogan, we tried to turn me heel. Oh. Yeah. Wow. We were in, I think we were at the Cow Palace in San Francisco, and I was supposed to come out with a baseball bat. Yeah, baseball bat gimmick, huh? And and whack him, whack him with the baseball bat, and mm -hmm. um, turn heel. Wow! And I whacked him with the baseball bat, and you guys all cheered. <laughs> <laughs> literally, literally, that that that's what happened. I mean, and I, I mean, my jaw dropped. And I went, <laughs> wow, wow. Came back to the dressing room area. Eric Bischoff said, "I think we'd be shooting ourselves in the foot to try to switch you heel right now." <laughs> hey Sting, uh, unfortunately we're going to be seeing Taker and Goldberg fight in Saudi Arabia in a few weeks. Did you say unfortunately? <laughs> Let's be real here, they're not as good anymore. Uh, it's me slow. Sorry. I don't know. I didn't get the I'm last I'm sure part. you're a better wrestler. Uh. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'm missing all the good stuff. What, what do you say? Oh. Uh, but like for the right price, would you come back to do a match with WWE? For the right price, would you come back and do a match? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me say. Let me add to this. One thing that I've known about pro wrestling, everybody's got a price. <laughs> no, I mean it. Obviously, it's not just for the the money. I mean, but. Yeah, I mean, for the right price, I would do it. <laughs> you know? uh, but I've always wanted to have that match. So, hi, uh, this is Adrian from Indiana. Nice to see you guys. Uh, besides Ready to Rumble, I know you had a couple run-ins on Thunder and Paradise. Uh, do you got any fun stories from being on that side of the camera? Just you know, David Arquette and Scotty Kahn. You know, those guys made me laugh on the set the whole time. You know, I had my character was stoic and stone faced, and I had to be that way on camera. So when there was a two shot deal where you know the camera was on me and we were having conversation, but the camera was not on them. It was my shot this time. They were behind the camera making, I mean, saying and doing stuff to, to make me laugh, and we had to do so many different takes. So a lot of fun um, working with those guys for sure. And, you know, I think a lot of you guys know the David Arquette story about me on the plane with him. You, you, no, you guys don't. Thank yeah, you. to this day, yeah. He didn't know me that well. I didn't know him either. He was doing stuff with us, obviously. We were sitting in the, on a plane traveling to the next city. 
first class. He was sitting right in front of me. He was reading this magazine. <clears throat> all the guys are sitting up there, and some businessmen and women sitting up there as well. And all the guys are like this, you know, sleeping. And David Arquette's, he's reading this thing, and, and I come up with my face like, like this. You know? I got to actually do it. You know? <laughs> so I get it. I'm just bored. So I want to mess with David Arquette because he doesn't know me. And I come up to him like this. No, 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 don't turn yet. Okay. Put the thing down so people can see you. They know he's got a magazine in his hand. So I'm like this. Now he can almost feel me breathing. So now he kind of kind of almost moves just his eyeballs. Just your eyeballs. Okay, I, uh, there we okay, okay. Right. all right. Now, now I actually turn. Yeah. He does that, okay? <laughs> so that's, we're setting the scene. So he does that. He turns around, he looks at me, he goes, and he just keeps looking straight ahead. And I, and I go, with a, with a joker face, I go, you reading? <laughs> he went, yeah. I knew it. <laughs> that was it. Now to this day, you know, I mean, to the, we go to the show, Nitro, the next day, we're in catering, I'm eating, he walks up behind me, he goes, he's right here, I turn, he goes, you eating? <laughs> yep. I knew it. So to this day, I mean, I, I saw him in an airport. I mean, it was like five years later, I saw him in an airport. He goes, you flying? <laughs> yep. I knew it. <laughs> oh. oh, that's correct. Got to cut time for a couple more questions. Hi, Sting. I'm Mark from New York. I was just wondering if you have any like, good stories with the great Muta. If I like the stories with great Muta? Any, like, any stories with the great Muta? Do you oh, have any great stories oh, of man. the great Muta? Yeah, you know, he was um, another guy who did a great moonsault. But I remember Dusty and I, you know, we went to Japan. It was just Dusty and me, and I was supposed to go wrestle Muda. And I was going to win at the Tokyo Dome, 65,000 people. And then, you know, he was going to come back to the States, and we were going to do a program together. And we got there, <clears throat> and I'm in the dressing room with him. And he's like Harley Race. He had the cigarette, too, like this in the dressing room, you know. So I said, he always did the same thing every time he saw me. He'd say, you good condition? I said, yeah, I good He goes, oh, me blow up. Oh, no, no. How, how long we go? I go, 30 minutes? Oh, no, no. We do 15, maybe 20? I blow up Sting. <laughs> so we're at the Tokyo Dome in the dressing room, and I go, so, you know, what are we going to do for a finish? He goes, moonsault. <laughs> I go, wait, wait, moonsault? So you're, you're, you're going over? He goes, yeah, I go over. Hmm. This is news to me. So we did the match. He went over. I talked to Dusty. I said, Dusty, you told me I was going over. What's going on here? He says, baby, just, just, just roll with it, baby. Come on, we're going to get him back over here in the United States, baby. We're going to have a, a good deal. You're going to get it back, I promise you, baby. Come on, let's go. Come on. Come on, Stinger. Yeah. That was a fun trip with Dusty. We were so dog-tired by the time we got back to the States. We were going up some escalator. Bags. He had one big bag, man. <laughs> it was a big bag. And so we're going up, and, you know, we're going up like this. He's got the bags in front of him like this. Now it gets to the top, and it gets stuck. And he's doing this. He goes over the top of the bag. I go over the top of Dusty. And that big bag, it goes, slides down the steps about 800 miles an hour toward a woman. She went like this. And stepped back in place and said, that was close. Yeah. Uh, All right. We have time for one more question. One more question. All right, we're not topping that, but let's try. We'll try. Paul from Huntsville, Alabama. A question, you guys talked a lot about the Hogan Sting match. 
What about Halloween Havoc 92, you and Jake Roberts and the very less than intimidating snake and how that match did not live up to expectations by most people's standards? What happened there? So what do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> I, I don't remember that match either. Is that the one, is that the one where Jake got the snake caught on his face? Yes, it is. And ran yeah. out of the, yep. the ring? Yeah, we don't remember. Coal Miner's Glove match? On a pole, yeah. Yes, yeah. Cold Miner's Glove on a pole match. <laughs> it's WCW, a pole is implied. I yeah. thought it was a the, great yeah, question. The, the only Jake story I can tell you is wrestling with him in Dallas, and, and I believe it was the old Sportatorium that the Von Erichs, yeah. He, he's, we wrestled in there, and I was so new and green, and you know, he had me in this hold, and we were just laying there, and I'm going, what are we doing, what are we doing? And he goes, we're in a hole, we're in a hole, just relax. You know, uh, why, why are we just laying here? Because there's, there's something going on up in the audience right now. And he goes, they're watching that, they're not watching us. So it turned out, we, you know, we thought there was a fight or something, but there was a kid, a young kid, a teenager with a 22, and he shot two rounds into the ring trying to kill Jake. No one got hit, no one ringside, <laughs> not me, not Jake. It was amazing. Wow. We, we got shot at. A lot of people don't know that. Whoa. Jake had heat, too, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That makes that coal miner's glove on the pole match kind of seem kind of shitty, doesn't it? After that. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, that, that's one of those matches I, I, I don't have anything to really add. Just, just your memory. I hope it's a good one. Right. Well, we, we've run out of time now. Sting's got a meet and greet coming up right after this. We want you to be a part of that. Uh, great career, buddy. Thank you. Hey, you know what? Hold on. Hold on a second. Wait a minute. I just want to say, Tony? Yep. It's good to see you again. It's good to see you again. Let's not wait 18 years. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, Tony, what a great history with Tony. What, what a pro. What a great guy. I'm, I am, you know, when I found out I was going to be doing a Q&A, but Tony was going to be facilitating and asking the questions, I said, this, this is good. So... Thank you, Tony. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Las Vegas. Let's hear it for the one and only Sting. Starcast 2 on Fight TV, David Crockett. I never saw that side of Sting before, and I worked I, with him for the best part of a decade. I never have either, but i tell you one thing. I, when he started talking about Tony, I had to pull my leg, legs up. It was getting deep, <laughs> getting real deep. Well, I but, almost forgot he was the Joker in TNA. That's a third persona to add to the stinger. Coming up on Fight TV here at StarCast 2 in fabulous Las Vegas, we got the Taz Show, the human suplex machine, doing his thing on the podcast. And we got a panel talking about what I think is the best book that summed up the history of TNT Monday Nitro. It's simply called Nitro David. We were there. It's one great book. StarCast is going great so far. Yes, it is. And everybody, there's so much more coming on. Stay tuned for it. Stay tuned. I'm Mark Madden. That's David Crockett at StarCast 2. Talking about the great years of World Championship Wrestling, the NWA and Jim Crockett Promotions. Tony and Friends thought they win, look Shivani's back again. World title split off, center stage, Bischoff, Disney Hogan and Nitro, New World Order and the Crow.